Hey, hi everybody. Welcome to today's session. We're going to get started in just a minute. Um, but in the meantime, before we get started, I'm wondering if you all wouldn't mind just dropping a quick note in chat, letting us know where you're from, um, either geographically or your organization. Just be nice to know who's joining us today. Raleigh, Jacksonville, some really lots of great um, Thailand, New York. Welcome, Reading. Hello, NorCal. Uh, let's see, Montana. That's a great, great mix of folks today. Excellent. Thank you for adding this in. <laughs> Hello, Jennifer. Hello, Tampa, Florida. Um, wonderful. All right, so we're going to go ahead and just get started. Um, hello, everybody, and welcome to this edition of the Public at App House, where we will be focusing on the power of technology to enhance civic participation. Also, a very warm welcome to our panelists today, who we'll be presenting in just a little bit. Um, so Public at App House events like this one are an initi initiative of Caravan Studios, which is a division of TechSoup. Caravan Studios works closely with different kinds of communities um, to understand the types of service issues that they might be having and how technology can help address and solve some of those issues. Um, and before we move into the presentation and the introductions to our panelists, I just wanna do a couple of quick housekeeping notes. Uh, we've all probably been doing a lot of Zoom, but just a couple of quick reminders. Um, one, we really encourage you to participate today. So if you have comments to share, please don't hesitate to put them in chat. And if you have questions that we would like that you would like us to talk through with the panelists at the end of the presentations, definitely pop them in the, the Q&A section and we'll be going through those at the end. Um, if you hear something cool in today's event, don't be shy, post on social media. Uh, please use the hashtag public good app house. And also finally, a quick reminder, um, you can turn on closed captioning Today, if you'd like to, um, the CC button is located uh, in your Zoom menu. So, and final thing to remind you all, don't forget to check your inbox after today's session. We're going to email you a replay and slides and some related resources um, following up on today's session. So, welcome to TechSoup Global Network, um, especially for those of you who are new here. Um, this is a lovely picture of the TechSoup team. Um, on a rooftop somewhere down near 4th and Brannan. Um, at TechSoup, we believe that technology like smartphones, internet connectivity, tech-enabled programs, all have the power to serve our communities better. And today's speaker with their Tech for Good apps are a fantastic representation of what that can mean. In today's presentation, we have three fantastic presenters. Dale McGrew, Executive Director of We Vote, Megan Brown, Senior Manager with Vote 411, and Deborah Cleaver, Founder and CEO of Vote America. Thank you all for being here today. I'm looking forward to seeing your demos. Um, and then one more, again, reminder is that we will be sharing a, a replay and some additional information after the session. So, um, and that's it. So again, we'll be taking questions at the end of the session. And with that, let me hand it over to Dale. But first, a quick intro. Ding, da, da. Prior to running WeVote, Dale successfully co-founded, built, and sold two high-tech corp startups, Gravity.com and GoLightly.com. Dale has managed large software projects for companies like Disney, IBM, and Crayola, and over 60 uh, nonprofits. And with that, let me hand it over to Dale to do today's presentation. Thank you, Catherine. And hello, everyone. Oops. All right, let me try again. <laughs> My apologies.
so this is a typical ballot book and it would take 15 hours to read it cover to cover. And then there's the political mailers. The sheer volume of information makes figuring out how to vote daunting and confusing. But even with an internet full of information, voters still feel uninformed. And the number of people who feel uninformed jumps from 44% to 76% when you ask voters who rarely vote. The impact of which is that over 20% of voters do not complete their ballot and others skip election day altogether. Representative democracy works best when more votes are cast. WeVote's mission is to help more Americans participate in democracy. And we've built an award-winning app that you can download from either app store or use on your computer. We help you figure out how to vote your values with a little help from those you trust. We do the Herculean task of combining ballot data from all 50 states side by side with endorsements from local papers and organizations across the political spectrum, like the ACLU and the American Conservative Union. Here's how it works. So you confirm your zip code and select the issues and opinions that you trust, and these make up your personal filters. Using your filters, WeVote gives you a personal score for candidates and measures on your ballot. So if you care about what the local League of Women Voters thinks about an upcoming infrastructure bond, WeVote's got you covered. And if you care about what your friends think and want to see their private views, we've got you covered. As a scrappy nonprofit technology startup with very little money put into marketing, we've still served over 115,000 voters. And our six-person analytics team tests and verify what's wor what works. And WeVote works. Over 38% of all visitors spend between three and 90 minutes learning on WeVote. And we're a community-driven project. WeVote's cutting-edge technology was built by over 100 wickedly talented open source volunteers. We currently have over 60 active volunteers across 11 internal teams that meet, week meet weekly, hailing from 22 different states. And these teams include our product design team, our marketing team, our political team, just as examples. Our vision is this, we see a tomorrow where every American's vote is aligned with their values. We think that giving voters all over America a way to engage with democracy in community will help increase voter turnout. So many things in life can be done better with the help of our friends and our communities. And we're obsessed with increasing voter turnout. We ask ourselves, or we asked ourselves, how do we turn these ideals into actions? So this is a good time to talk about the elephant in the room, which is the urgency that many Americans feel about upcoming and close elections. And regardless of which politicians you support, control of this country is being determined by these close elections. Close races are the new normal. And in 2022, a national US Senate seat was decided by less than 8,000 votes out of over a million votes cast. So how do we turn all turn this sense of urgency into positive actions? And here's how we're doing it. We're creating a scoreboard. This scoreboard will show the actions that get more Americans voting. The specific reasons that more that Americans, some Americans aren't voting, can become overcome if someone that they know and trust helps them. The voters tracking politics need better tools to engage the 40% of Americans in our communities who are just living their lives and not voting. WeVote isn't striving to provide more or deeper information like the League of Women, of Women Voters does so well. WeVote is creating products and experiences that inspire and activate more Americans to participate in democracy using proven techniques like relational persuasion. So it's my pleasure to announce Democracy Squads, a new product that we're launching for the 2024 primaries. And these group experiences can be partisan or non-partisan or, non -partisan or partisan. You'll be able to create your very own squad and coordinate everything you and your friends are doing to help democracy thrive. Your squad is part of a bigger movement driving to inspire and activate over a million voters. Uh, we vote will make visible the activity and successes of democracy's squads all over America. And you decide how comfortable with talking politics your squad is. You can form a nonpartisan squad of parents at your kid's school that focuses on the when, why, and how of voting, 
or you can gather a highly partisan group of friends who are in it to win it. It's really up to this to each squad. If you want to be the first to see democracy squads, I encourage you to join our beta program by emailing us at info at wevote.us or contact us through our website at wevote.us. We're in an active design phase for our first publishable study. Please let me know if you'd like to get involved. And like I mentioned, we also have 11 internal volunteer teams that meet weekly, ranging from political data to social media to engineering. You can find the volunteer link in the footer of WeVote, of the WeVote website if you wanna learn more. So join us. I wanna take a quick moment to thank some of the organizations who've helped us so much. We really couldn't do our work without all the uh, support that they provide us as a nonprofit. And I and uh, thank you for your attention and to, the, to our hosts at TechSoup and to my fellow presenters who are just doing critical and inspiring work. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dale. Really appreciate hearing the updates. Um, fantastic work. Um, and a reminder to everyone uh, who's on the, uh, the call today, please don't hesitate to drop questions into Q&A. Um, and we will be taking questions at the end of all three um, presentations. So thank you so much. Um, next up, uh, Megan Brown. Uh, Megan is the senior manager with Vote 411. Um, the, with the League of Women Voters. In this capacity, Megan manages and maintains vote411.org, including updating election information in all 50 states and DC, and also helping hundreds of state and local leagues provide candidate information through the online voter's guide and spreading the word about the website to ensure that voters know where to find election information when it comes to election day. Thank you, Megan, for joining us and please take it away. All right. Thank you, everybody. Let me share my screen. Of course, my PowerPoint got hidden, but there we go. All right. So thank you again. Uh, I am Megan Brown. I am the Vote for One One Senior Manager. Vote for One One is a product of the League of Women Voters. Uh, we are so I work at the League of Women Voters, but my main role is Vote for One One. So what is Vote for One One? It is the League's election uh, education website. We call it the one-stop shop for election-related information. It has everything voters need to know about voting and how to successfully cast their ballot in all 50 states and DC. And we're really excited to have this information also available in Spanish in all 50 states and DC. We launched our Spanish uh, website in 2020. So anytime we update any of the English content, all of our Spanish content gets updated as well. So the voters have the information in the language they feel most comfortable with. And what does that information look like? We literally have everything voters need to know to successfully cast their ballot. But there are just some key features that I really wanted to highlight today. And the first of which is our nationwide candidate information or our voters guides. And this is where we allow candidates to talk directly to the voters in their own words. So we are a volunteer organization and we have volunteers all across the country who contact candidates and ask them questions that are important to the voters in their communities. And those candidates answer those questions directly and unedited by the league and we publish those on Vote for One One. We believe that the candidates being able to speak directly to the voters in their own words is key to allowing voters the opportunity to see who these voters are or these candidates are and what they stand for and how well they would fit if they were to be elected uh, for that office. It's a really great um, resource for voters and it's a really fun interactive way that you can contact and interact with, with the candidates directly. But we know that there's so much more that voters need to know before they can successfully cast their ballot. So Vote for One One has polling place information and hours. We have the ability to register uh, through Vote 411 to request your absentee ballot. And then we have all of the what we call rules of the road, which are things like the ID requirements for either voting or registering or early voting options or absentee options and every single thing uh, that you need to know to vote in your state. Because we all know all, all 50 states in DC have very different election rules. And so voters need to know the rules in their states so that they are able to successfully cast their ballots. 
So I'm not going to read all of these quotes, but I did want to share what voters have said about Vote for 1-1. Our ultimate goal is to empower voters so that they can go out and vote in each and every election cycle. And being able to do this work and then hear from the voters that we have impacted and helped vote is really inspiring. And so it's really great um, in my position that I actually get to hear from voters regularly about how we actually help them go vote. Um, it's why we do what we do. It's really the turnout piece uh, to really increase and make sure that everybody feels empowered to go cast their ballot in every single election cycle. A really interesting piece on Vote for 1-1 is that we can have address-specific information. There is some state-specific information, like those rules of the road that, you know, apply to every single voter in that state. But then there is address-specific information, things like your polling place. Your polling place is related to where you live. We can uh, display your election day, your early voting, and your drop box locations on Vote for 1-1 based on your address. We can also display your personalized candidate information that is only going to show your races and your candidates that appear on your specific ballot. This is really key because voters don't know what districts they live in. Uh, they may know what U.S. House district they live in, but what about city council or school board? And we take the guesswork out of that. You enter your address on Vote for 1-1, and then you see only the races and candidates that will be appearing on your ballot. You can go through and select the candidates, compare where they stand on the issues, and make your selections. You can say, I plan to choose for Jimmy Bean the dog in this race. And when you're done, you can email, text, or print your choices so that you can bring them with you to the polls. Or if you're voting an absentee or by mail ballot, you can use that information to vote your ballot. And it's going to go all the way through your own personalized information and takes the guesswork out of, of voting. And like I said earlier, we really do have a get out the vote or GOTV component to vote for 1-1. Uh, we do email folks through our registration tool if they opt into emails. And every federal cycle, we do research into if the people who register through vote for 1-1 turned out. Uh, in every single federal cycle for the past few cycles, more people or people who registered through vote for 1-1 turned out to vote at a higher rate than the regular voting populace. And we attribute that in part to the GOTV messaging that we send to those voters if they opt into our emails. But then we also have the ability to create your voting plan, making sure that you plan how and when you are going to vote before election day is key in making sure that you actually can successfully cast your ballot. And one of the steps in the make your voting plan is to share your plan with your friends and your family, just like Dale was talking about, making this a social interaction actually will increase uh, the turnout and the likelihood that you're going to go and vote. So now that I've talked about everything that Vote for One has in a very high level uh, aspect, I did want to spend just a minute to go over a couple partnership opportunities that we have for you and your organizations. The first one here is a co-branded Vote for One One homepage where we have your company or organization's logo and brand colors on our Vote for One One homepage. You get your own unique URL and it's a way for you to share all of the content that we have on Vote for One One with your users, your members, your employees uh, as a trusted resource. Uh, we have reached tens of millions of voters over the past few cycles, but we know that there's tens of millions of voters who have yet to learn about Vote for One One. And partnering with organizations such as yours is a great way to get the information that we've already created and compiled and are sharing in front of more voters. Um, it's a really quick and easy process to get this set up. There is a fee an, associated to it. So if you're interested in this, just send me an email um, and I can walk you through your options and get you, get you started. We can get you a page literally in a day. <laughs> it's a really quick and easy process. But if you're not interested in that co-branded homepage, and there's other partnership opportunities. So you can share about Vote for 1-1. We love it when people link uh, back to our resource and email communications from their websites, uh, social media. You can follow us on social media. We have all of our channels. You can share the resources that we're sharing through, through those channels. Uh, we are a volunteer organization. So we have state and local leagues with people on the ground doing this work in person, in their communities that you can partner with them. You can join your local league. You can become a member, you can be a volunteer um, and do some of the great work that we're doing on the ground. And then finally, 
I did have to throw in our candidate pressure campaign. So like I said, we're contacting candidates, asking them questions, and some candidates don't want to respond or they may not have time or they might miss our email. Uh, we have a really comprehensive candidate pressure campaign that has you, the voters living in their districts, contacting these candidates, asking them to answer our questions. Um, I have all the information on how you can participate that in that on Vote 411. There are sample emails, sample tweets, uh, all the things that you need. And it's a really great way uh, to participate kind of from the comfort of your own home and really help be civically engaged and get more candidate information out there uh, to the voters. And with that, I'm gonna turn this back and I look forward to uh, answering all of your great questions. Thank you so much, Megan. That was fantastic. Um, it was great to learn more about that program. Um, and we have some great questions um, coming in. Uh, and I look forward to sharing those after the end of all the presentations. Uh, and now we're going to move to our final presentation for today. Um, welcome, Deborah Cleaver. Uh, Deborah has been working at the intersection of technology and democracy since 2004. Uh, she is a serial founder whose organizations include Vote America, ElectionDay.org, Vote.org, Long Distance Voter, and Swing the State. And with that, let me hand it over to Deborah. And thank you very much. Take it away. Uh, thank you so much for having me today. And I feel like what my bio actually should say is that I am responsible for helping to popularize those unsolicited text messages that you get. In 2016, I realized that we could send text messages to unregistered voters and encourage them to register to vote. And I told everyone who I pitched for funding that this was a loophole and that it would be closed soon. And uh, almost no one would fund me. And now it is an outrageously popular tactic. And I am very sorry for that, everybody. But it did work really well in 2016 to get unregistered people to vote. So hi, I'm Deborah. Um, and uh, I am going to share my presentation as soon as I can get it to work. Um, so I'm Deborah, I'm with Vote America, and uh, over the past few years, Vote America has, uh, well, Vote America builds technology that makes it easier to vote because uh, voting is harder in the United States than in any other nation with democratically elected leadership. So it's not that Americans need to be convinced to vote, it's that they need to be able to vote. And uh, as we all know, there's 50 states, 50 sets of rules, and most government websites aren't exactly optimized for voters. So we joke internally and sometimes externally that Vote America does the government's job. And um, so the team is an even mix of voting experts and technology experts. And we focus a lot of our time and our energy on building embeddable widgets that help voters navigate needlessly complicated systems. And Oops. Uh, so currently, we actually have more tools than is on this slide. We have a register tool, which helps people register to vote. We have a verify tool that helps you check your registration status. Uh, we have an absentee ballot tool, which helps people request their absentee ballots in all 50 states. Uh, the rules around voting by mail are constantly changing. And just to make life really fun, a lot of the states change the form every year and they will reject your request if you're using last year's form instead of this year's form, even if the only difference to the forms is the date listed in the footer. Uh, we have a tool that we call Locator, which helps you find your polling place location, your early voting center and your ballot drop boxes. Um, we have a standalone reminder tools, which just lets people opt into our email and SMS election reminders. Um, and like other people on this call, we have found that reminding people to vote uh, increases turnout. And we just rolled out a new tool last week where um, if you enter in your home address, it will tell you upcoming elections that are tied to your address because there's always an election coming. It's not just the presidential elections. Um, 
Another thing that we offer that we're particularly proud of is all of the information that's on our website is available via an API so that you can build an election center on your own website. Uh, we have about 100 pieces of data that we track and update uh, regularly for each state. And this screenshot shows you an election center that Credit Karma built in 2020, which was really awesome to watch. Um, they built it and then they helped about half a million people register and actually cast ballots in the 2020 election. Um, the software is pretty easy. We've taken a slightly different route than uh, Vote 411. So if you work with us, instead of people coming to our website and seeing something co-branded, they'll go to your website and the tools will be embedded on your website. It's as um, easy as embedding a YouTube video. You just cut and paste two lines of code and then the tool appears on your website. Um, and then so, you know, any action that someone can take on the Vote America website, they can also take on your website. And then we have a customer portal, which is updated hourly. So you'll see the results quickly and you'll get access to all of the data that your users enter into um, our widgets. We both get access. And um, anyone who goes through a tool that's powered by Vote America is opted into um, email and SMS, S oh, sorry, email and SMS election reminders in perpetuity. Um, so even if you stop being a Vote America customer, we'll make sure to remind um, your users when it's time to vote. And we do federal elections, statewide elections, and next year we're planning on getting down to citywide elections for the 100 largest cities in America. A um, Couple of things that make our tools awesome, but I wanna say that Vote for on ones tools and WeVote's tools are also awesome, uh, is that we focused a lot on making them really easy to embed. Um, and we spend a lot of time optimizing the user experience so as many people as possible get through the workflow. Um, we also offer support for anyone who wants to do like advanced testing. Um, so if you're running A-B tests on copy or messaging, it, uh, it's really easy to run that through our tools. We support all the analytics systems, the MetaPixel, Google Pixel, Heap Pixels, um, anything like that. The tools were actually optimized for all devices, so they look great um, and they load really, really fast. And uh, one thing that sets everyone on this call apart from some other people who build tools is that none of us are in this for profit. There are, um, surprisingly to me, there are now a bunch of venture-backed companies in this space that build voter mobilization tools. Uh, but everyone on this call is purpose-driven, not profit-driven. So we're literally only charging money so that we can continue to support the work that we do. And all of the money that Vote America uh, makes from licensing our tools is used to fund Vote America's non-partisan mobilization campaigns. We've also focused a lot on security over the past few years because uh, there is a fair, um, there are a fair amount of nefarious actors, uh, both domestically and internationally, who like to interfere in U.S. elections. So our tools are SOC2 compliant and HIPAA compliant, and we pay for penetration testing, which means we pay hackers to try to break our tools every year, which is expensive and fun, but worth it. And then we're hosted on uh, AWS, which means if our site is down, so is the internet. And also uh, protected by Cloudflare, which again, just means that you can trust our tools with um, sensitive data, such as full names and date of birth. Uh, we also offer, uh, this is a little advanced, but I think some of you will appreciate this, um, code-free integrations with a bunch of other platforms that you might use, such as Action Network, MailChimp, uh, Salesforce, and HubSpot, and even Google Sheets, which means that you can sync the data that comes in via uh, your instance of our tools to the other tools that you use, which is really great 
for uh, any other projects that you have going on. Here are some of the people that we've worked with over the years. Uh, you know, I should say that the size of the logo does not indicate anything other than the size of the logo that various people have sent us. Um, we tend to work more with progressive organizations, but there's no actual reason for that. That just happens to be the people who reach out to us us uh, because we are a nonpartisan organization. And if you are trying to increase voter turnout, then you are someone that we would like to work with. Um, I probably should have started with this, but if you'd like to give any of our tools a test drive, just go to demo.voteamerica.com um, and you can enter real data, junk data, whatever makes your heart sing. Um, we don't save that data anywhere. We erase it every night at midnight. And that is my last slide. Uh, looking forward to the Q&A part of our, uh, our webinar. Thank you so much, Deborah. Um, fantastic presentation again. Incredibly inspiring work that you all do. Um, and we really appreciate it, your time coming here and sharing what you're doing with this group. Um, and it also a reminder to folks attending today, we will be sending out um, a replay from today's event, uh, along with some slides and any related resources that we talked about that you should be getting an email in the next few days or so. Um, and now uh, we are switching to the Q&A portion of today's event. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just dive in. Uh, the first question comes from Sarah, and uh, this is for all three folks, uh, I believe. The question is, what if we have our own civic engagement or legislator accountability app idea? I don't know who wants to jump in with that one first. Sorry, Dale. I, I, I can start. So we work with a number of different open source and civic tech organizations that are you know, dealing with the same challenges we are, what's on the ballot data, you name it. So feel free to reach out if you'd like to, to me, I'm happy to answer questions. And um, so it's info at wevote.us if you wanna pop a note to me. It's a great, it's really interesting what's going on out there. And I, I'm, I'm a big fan of everybody collaborating. That was going to be my same answer as well. Uh, collaboration is really key. There's no reason that we all need to reinvent the wheel because we're all out here, like Deborah said, we're in it to get turn out the vote, get people voting. Um, so feel free, I reach out. If you've got any ideas, we'll see what we can do. Thank you both. Um, let me go ahead and just move on to the next one. Um, this question is from David. And again, it's for all presenters or a mix of them. Um, do you address voting across the civilized world or just in the US? Do you work with other democracy organizations overseas like My Society, Democracy Club, or initiatives in Taiwan? So I can speak to Vote for 1 1. We are US specific. Um, I feel like the US is made up of 51 different voting countries, because um, all of the states are very different. So we are US specific. We do have information for what are called overseas voters on Vote for 1-1 so that you can find how you can vote if you are an American citizen who's living overseas. Uh, we do have that information available, but we do focus on US specifically. I have the same answer that uh, Megan has, which is that US democracy keeps us pretty busy. Um, although I have consulted on occasion with people outside of the US, but Vote America, pretty specific to America currently. Yeah, same answer as Deborah and Megan. We've talked to groups like My Society to try to learn, and there's so many differences just in the in the mechanics. So we decided to focus on the US. Thank you all. Um, Jonathan asks, um, and this is specific to Vote 411, uh, will public questions appear on Vote 411? So our questions, so I'm assuming I could be, this could go either way. Um, so I'm going to answer both 
the way I'm interpreting it. So we do have our volunteers who ask candidates questions uh, that are about the issues in their community, and those are pu are published on Vote for One One when our volunteers publish them. Uh, the other way I'm interpreting that is like ballot measures or constitutional amendments that are going to be on your ballot. And yes, those are also available on Vote for One One. And oftentimes our volunteers do kind of the extra steps to write up what, you know, what a yes vote means and what a no vote means, because oftentimes the ballot language is confusing and not always clear what a yes and no vote means. So that additional information is also available on Vote for One One for those ballot measures. And if there was a third option for what that question is, um, let me know and I can answer it a third way as well. Thank you, Megan. We'll let you know if there any if follow up comes up from that question, but thank you. Um, all right, um, let's see. A question from Anne. Uh, also for for one for vote four one one, um, does vote four one one have a configuration for phones? Yes. So while we were launched in two thousand and six, we have completely overhauled the website in the last couple of years, and the way that we did it was mobile first. So we designed the website for mobile and then expanded it to different screen sizes. So everything on Vote for One One is mobile friendly. Uh, it was created for mobile devices. Um, really and yeah you can use it on any size screen thank you very much um let's see um another a more broad question uh, i think for all three of you or how you however you would like to jump in um are your resources available in multiple languages um and we did have one specific question about whether some of the technology is available in french um so if all three of you can answer that that would be great so I can jump in first. So Vote for One One is available in English and Spanish. Uh, we are looking at additional languages. I will say that some of our candidate information is available in additional languages. We have our friends from Texas who do it in Vietnamese and Chinese as well. Um, so we do have the ability to have portions of our information in multiple languages. Uh, we are looking to expand it. It's basically running two websites, <laughs> having it in two languages. Um, so it takes a little bit of time uh, to get those languages, but I would love to have this information in as many languages as possible. Voting's hard enough for English as a first language speakers. Uh, having the information in a language that voters prefer is really key to helping them kind of navigate the process. So we don't have French yet, uh, but it would be amazing. I would love to have additional languages. I have a disappointing answer, which is that our information is currently only available in English. And since everyone on this call probably runs or works for a nonprofit, you know the reason it's hard to raise money um, to translate things. And uh, as Megan said, it's the equivalent of having two or more websites. So um, we can't just translate it once. Every time we change something in English, we would have to translate into other languages. So while we do have the resources internally to build the tech framework that would support multiple languages, we don't have the people to translate. But one day, one day we will get there with multiple languages. Fingers crossed. Absolutely. And I want to echo De Deborah's comment that the fundraising space in the in this particular space is is it's challenging. It's it's more challenging than even other nonprofit spaces fundraising for election related projects. Um, so yeah, the desire is fully there. We have uh, people who speak multiple languages on our team and, and we're looking for opportunities, but it, it's just such a heavy lift that we would love to do and hope to do in the future. Um, we Vote also does have an iOS and, and Android app and um, we keep we, our website. We usually lead with changes on our website and then update within three to five months on our iOS and Android apps. Thank you all very much. Um, and now another question actually for all three of you again. Um, how do you measure the impact or success of your tech tools? Oh, I can I can uh, go first. So if someone uses our tools, we uh, store their information in our database. And then after the elections, we match people back to the voter file because whether or not you vote is public record. 
So we actually consider uh, Ballard's cast to be a uh, success. And um, we don't know how you vote, but we do know if you vote. So we do, that's how we measure success. We have a, a small data team and we have access to the national file. Yeah, I feel like my answer is very similar. As I said in the presentation, tracking who uses our registration tool, because um, they are the ones we have their email and their identifiable information to make sure they turn out to vote. Uh, but we don't collect any other identifiable information for voters. So one way that we measure success is how many users come to the website after e each election cycle. So every single cycle is different we compare to the most like election cycle. We could never compare, you know, 2020 to 2023 because they're very different cycles. So we we measure success on how many people are finding our resource and how long they are staying on, on the page because then we can see, you know, are they getting the information that they're looking for? Analytics are absolutely key and also really fun to see how people are using the site, what, what's working, what's not working. So I echo what they're saying and, and um, you know, everybody wants to even do deeper and deeper analytics. So, so it's, it's a, a space that deserves a lot of attention for sure. Thank you very much. Um, and now we have a question from Ron who asks, uh, in a partnership with Vote 411 or Vote America, will you reach out to voters of the partner org if they are already reaching out through phone banking and texting? What does communication look like with partners? We tend to reach out to um, everyone who's used one of our tools unless a partner specifically asks us not to. Um, all of our information is like pure information, uh, sorry, all of our text messages are informational only. Our best performing text messages just provide polling place location, um, whereas generally our partners are talking more about issue advocacy and things like that. So unless someone asks us specifically to not communicate with their people, we do. Um, generally over communicating won't decrease turnout, but under communicating will, and not all of our partners have the resources to reach out. So by default, we communicate and there've been a handful of times that we've held back uh, based on partner request. And through our partnership uh, co-branded webpage, we provide you as the partner with trainings. We can have videos to talk to your members and talk about how you can use the resource, how you can share the resource, uh, but we don't communicate with any of your members or your community directly. And that's because like I just said, we don't collect any identifying information for the users. Uh, we don't save their address or any of that stuff. So we will not be contacting any of your users uh, we do have a tool that can send out text messages that our state and local leagues use for text banking. And if that's something that you would be interested in, we could absolutely set something up and do a partnership. Uh, we have had a couple of partners do text banking um, through their white label. It's called the white label, the co-branded homepage. Um, so that is something we can do, uh, but it's not an audible. Like, we won't contact any of your users directly. Awesome. Thank you. Um, a question from Kimberly. Uh, if we get a page with your org, will we be able to track the number of people who have been registered or signed up? And I think that's for all three of you. Yes, 100%. Um, if you have the co-branded page, you get a really fun report. Um, it can be at any time. I use, I send it automatically after the general election, um, but we can give you those analytics at any time and you can see how many people are using the page, where they're entering, where they're exiting, whatever demographic uh, information is available through Google. Google Analytics 4 has changed the demographic information that they share. Um, so it's it's really dependent on what's available through the analytics, but you get a good report and it's a really great way for you to see your impact, right? Like that you have this page, you want the people uh, to find the resource and interact with the resource. Um, so we absolutely provide those analytics. I, I'm like Dale, I love analytics. I wish that's all I spend my time on because it's so much fun. Um, and we want you guys to have the same opportunity to see those numbers as well. Similar answer, we have a customer dashboard where people can log in and it's updated hourly and it 
also includes tables of information. Uh, interesting difference with us in Vote 411 is we will let you download all of that person's information. Um, and then if people are really interested in it, we'll do matchbacks post-election to see what percentage of the people who came in via your instance of the tools actually voted. Um, so yeah, we all I think we all like numbers on this call. Definitely. And for the democracy squads, we really focus on voters registered, voters activated, and then on the partisan side, the candidates supported. And um, dashboard is critical to it, for sure. Yeah, because it's, you know, you can't win a game if you don't have a scoreboard. I love that line. I think I'll be using it. Thank you, Dale. <laughs> um, so okay, we have another question from Margaret. And this one is following up on, um, I think, information shared by Deborah during her presentation, and it's for uh, Dale and Megan. Um, she says, I heard Deborah's answer on this, but curious to learn about election coverage, federal, state, local, like how small for everyone, for Dale and Megan. So that's a great question that I didn't even talk about. Um, Vote for 1-1, we provide the election dates for every single election in the country, no matter how big or small. And I don't know if there are folks on here from South Carolina, but I swear you have an election daily uh, in South Carolina. And we provide all those election dates and registration deadlines for you. Uh, our volunteers who work on our candidate information also cover down ballot. We really try to, in at least the top 800 most populous cities provide the down ballot information so that you can see your entire ballot uh, and candidate information. And we oftentimes have leagues filling in the gaps in, in the smaller communities as well, depending on their state. Um, we really want to focus on those local elections. There's so much information out there on presidential candidates and US House and all of those. But it's a school board. And I just found out that there are cemetery trustees in Massachusetts. like. There are so many local elections that people just don't know about. And we really try to cover as many as possible. Yeah, and my answer is that, so the there are five major organizations that are gathering what's on the ballot data and it's really painstaking work. We try to work with all, as many of them as we can. We've had, you know, relationships and conversations with at least four of them. So it's, for us, it is more of a translating into the financial of how much of it, how much can we purchase? So um, so it's, I really, my hat's off to the people who are actually collecting it. And I, you know, vote for one one is, is right up there in terms of the top collectors of data. So it's, it's really inspiring to see that. And also interesting to see that, you know, with 7,000 different potential sources of information, like ranging from a state registrar to a county office, to a city office, no, I don't like if we put all of those five providers together, I'm not sure we would still even have more than 90 percent of what's on the ballot. Um, that's a made up number out of my head, but that's my guess. And um, I think that in the long run, the more that we can do to work with those local election officials to convert their data to digital so that the people collecting it can can uh, aggregate it and get it out to all the apps providers, the, the better. Thank you all. That was really, really helpful. Um, Deborah, do you have anything you wanted to add to that one? I know that. Um... Yeah, just a, a quick addition to that. So I was specifically okay. talking about when we send out election reminders. Um, all of our applications work for every election. Um, I think Megan's correct. South Carolina seems to have one weekly, um, but all of the tools with the possible exception of the polling place locator mm -hmm. do work for every election. Um, uh, similar to Dale, we're reliant on other groups to get some of our data. And because there are frequent elections and because the information isn't always accessible, um, our polling place locator tool doesn't always return information. But if it doesn't, it does refer you to the state directly and hopefully you can get it there. Um, there are too many elections in this country and there are no standards for how election data uh, is shared with the public. So yeah, there are probably five 
uh, organizations in this country, including Vote 411, that do the painstaking work of gathering all this local data and then sharing it generally in APIs so that the rest of us can help share it with as many voters as possible. Um, that is fantastic, by the way. Um, and a follow-up question on your responses um, from Jeffrey. Uh, can you repeat the comments about local candidates? Would this include township supervisors, for example? And this is in reference to Pennsylvania. So for our information, yes, it does include township supervisors. Um, it, and specifically in Pennsylvania, we do have good content in Pennsylvania. Um, I don't know if you live in, in Pittsburgh, but there's like 16,000 candidates in Pittsburgh. Um, and uh, as everyone was saying, none of this information is digitized. A lot of times we type directly from PDFs that are on county board of election websites so that we can import it into our tools. But yes, we try to cover 100% down ballot to include supervisors, school boards, city councils, the cemetery trustees, uh, water boards, all those uh, that we are able to find and then contact the candidates to ask the question. So yes, we try to get all the down ballot information. Wonderful, thank you for clarifying that. Um, and we have, I believe, really uh, time just for one more question. Um, and this is for everyone. Um, and it is from David. How do you explain different mathematical voting systems in different places? Uh, STV versus majority versus some, anything else uh, to make them clear to voters? My mute was have throwing a fit. Um, on our ballot tool, we will at the very top tell you what type of voting option it is. Is it uh, multi-select? If it is, we tell you how many candidates you can vote for, uh, and we won't kind of move you on to then automatically to the next uh, page until you've selected your choices. If it's ranked choice voting, we allow you to make your selections and rank them. And then if it's single vote or winners take all, we just say if you vote for one. Uh, so we make it really at the top of the page. And we designed it specifically in our new ballot that we launched earlier this year to be in a highlighting color uh, to make it more visible because it was something that people easily miss. And you just assume that you can vote for one candidate. But there are so many races out there that are either ranked choice or multi-select. Uh, my local elections this year are ranked choice for the very first time. We voted for it two years ago. Um, and so I know there's a big educational piece on that and how to vote rank. Um, so we give all the instructions there directly on the ballot while the voters are using the resource so that they can really make their decisions and know how many to vote for or how many to rank. Yeah, I'll just chime in really quickly. The user interface is critical, and um, yeah, it, it, Vote Four One One has done a great job on their on their ballot. Really seen it change over the years. So we do a lot of iteration. We use analytics, and and um, we're so we haven't done a ton of like approval voting or or the various you know uh, proposals that are out there for for different ways of voting or even support the deeper levels of ranked choice voting, for example, um, where we view ourselves as more of a social layer on top of what's on the ballot. And um, we're, we're focusing on making it easy to share information across different um, items on the ballot, as opposed to it being a, a single, what am I doing by myself? I think we focus more, I know we focus more on the when to vote, where to vote and what to bring and then trust that the jurisdictions, and maybe I shouldn't do this, that have done things like past ranked choice voting, remember to budget, to teach people how to uh, actually use ranked choice voting. Um, but now you're making me realize that we might need to add another tool to our website where we can help people practice for these things. Um, that is one of the roadblocks to voting that we haven't yet built a tool to help people clear. Um, yeah. Excellent, thank you all. Um, any other final comments on that last question? Otherwise we're gonna move to wrapping up today. Yeah. All right, great. 
So thank you again to our amazing speakers. Thank you for joining us today and sharing what you've been working on. It's all very inspiring. Um, I know I learned a lot and it was fantastic hearing from you all. Um, folks uh, who've joined us today, please feel free to drop a line in chat about something maybe you learned today. Uh, we'd love to hear some feedback immediately if you can um, and hear what you're, what inspired you, what you learned about today. That would be fantastic. Um, and we'll go ahead and read some, some notes out loud as they come through. Um, just another quick note, if you are on the call today and you really liked what you saw um, and you wanna perhaps support future demo events and reach nonprofits and the communities are curious about how to use technology, um, become a sponsor. Uh, we are happy to talk to you. Please drop us a line. Um, Susan Tenby, who heads up our community outreach work and our sponsorships is a fantastic person to work for and we'll be happy to talk with you. Her email is right there on the slide and will also be included in follow-up information. Um, again, thank you so much for the speakers today. Fantastic work. It's incredibly important and inspiring to hear what you're doing. Um, and finally, um, before we say goodbye, a reminder that um, to please clean, to fill out the post-event survey and also another reminder that we will be sending along the slides and a recording and related follow-up information. So thank you everybody for joining. Um, let's see, just a couple, before we actually officially close, let me read a couple of quick chats. Um, people are excited about using the app. Um, lots of kudos to the presenters for being willing to meet after the presentation today. And also thank you for that. Uh, this is how we start to, to build impact. So it's wonderful to see all that. Um, and, those are the main themes I'm seeing here. So wonderful job, everybody. Thank you so much and um, have a great rest of your day.